last year we ended the year with a talk on uh, software architecture and i thought uh, we'll follow up from that uh, topic to a related topic and uh, that's why today's talk is about uh, requirements engineering but we are not going to talk about requirements engineering on its own we are going to see how design thinking can be applied to requirements engineering so that would be the focus of the talk so how this talk is structured i will start by uh, giving an overview of design thinking and requirements engineering as separate disciplines and uh, at least most of you i believe are uh, developers so you will be familiar with requirements engineering design thinking comes from the design discipline so many of us will not be familiar with that so we will talk about de design thinking as well and because today's talk is kind of heavy on theory so i will take a break here and then we will look at uh, some examples real world examples of apps or uh, you know examples from the world of technology then we will see how uh, we can uh, apply design thinking to requirements engineering so that would be the structure of this talk so let's begin i'll start by sharing my screen so can you confirm if you can see my screen yes we can yeah so let's start by uh, well let's not start with design thinking let's instead start with uh, understanding what is uh, understanding what is requirements uh, engineering so uh, let's have a show of hands uh, in the audience how many of you are engineers or developers rather software developers or architects Okay, uh, three, four, five, six, seven. Almost all of us, right? Eight. How many of you are coming from the design discipline? That is, you are designers. Either you are designing user experience or user interfaces. How many of you consider yourself as designers? So maybe a few of you, uh, two, three. Uh, some of you are overlapping. You consider yourself. both engineers as well as designers which is the case in startups right you may have to play multiple roles that brings its own set of challenges because when we are developers we often think in terms of implementation we don't think in terms of design or we don't adequately consider the user perspective so being a developer is kind of a handicap in this case because it prevents us from seeing the user perspective so we'll talk a little bit more about that later so yeah so this is what we have uh, now the uh, requirements engineering is not something new any type of project you take particularly a software project it often starts with understanding the business context understanding the problem and then looking at what the user expects what kind of solutions you uh, could address this problem so requirements or specifying the requirements is very much at the heart of uh, software engineering and in fact the software engineering process starts with the requirements uh, gathering as people call it and then from there the output of requirements engineering is writing the formal specifications so i have heard of stories where you know there is a requirements specialist who will travel to the customer site he may spend 2 3 weeks or even a month at the customer site understanding uh, the requirements talking to different stakeholders maybe it's business people architects of the customer or you know actual users of the system so the requirements expert will talk to all these people at the customer site understand the requirements and produce formal specifications and then these specifications will be discussed with the customer and then they will be signed off so the requirements will be integrated into the contract and everything will be agreed uh, you know in black and white so to speak so that was the 
case, you know, maybe 50 years ago or even as recent as 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Today, the world has changed. Requirements engineering is not uh, done so rigidly because we have ditched that uh, traditional waterfall model towards more agile methods. So in the case of agile, requirements engineering is uh, not something that takes uh, you know, uh, a time frame of weeks or months. Requirements engineering has to be done. It may take time, but it has to be done kind of iteratively because in Agile, one of the things that they emphasize is the iterations, quick, short iterations. And secondly, in Agile, they don't focus or emphasize so much on documentation. The emphasis on Agile is more on working software rather than exhaustive documentation. So requirements may be just a bunch of, uh, you know, bullet points or brief description. Uh, so high level requirements are described and then, you know, uh, quickly in Agile, we try to uh, iterate, come up with an MVP or a quick uh, software prototype of the system. And then further iterations happen to build on that. So one of the good approaches which talks uh, good uh, resources for understanding uh, requirements is this book which is freely available online software requirements by Vegas and BT so you can download this you know from the web and uh, like it's gone through uh, three editions so it's one of the recommended books for understanding software requirements there are, of course, other books out there, and they are also authored by the first author, Vigas. So those of you who want to understand uh, requirements, you can, uh, or the practice of requirements engineering, you can start with this book, which gives a very detailed view of what this discipline is all about. But briefly, requirements engineering uh, has two main components. One is the development of requirements, right? And the other is the management of requirements. So requirements engineering can be split into two parts. One is development. What this implies, this implies that somehow you have to try to understand what the user wants, what is expected of the system, right? And how to write, how to translate those requirements into, into let's say, specifications, how to understand the user's perspective. All these are covered under development of requirements. But while you are developing these requirements, you should also try to get feedback from the user. So how to get feedback? Uh, that is what is known as validating the requirements. So we might build some sort of a rough prototype or in software, uh, in the world of apps, we talk about uh, wireframe diagrams or drawing uh, user stories. So any kind of uh, tool or visualization can be used to gather feedback and validate these requirements. So that is what uh, requirements development is all about. Then comes the other aspect of requirements engineering, which is management. So we know from uh, our own experience that requirements are hardly static. The project starts with a certain set of requirements. But you know, we have always problematic customers or market dynamics are always changing. Market requirements are changing. So project starts with certain requirement, but that those requirements can change as the project goes along. So management is all about that. How do you manage the changing requirements? How do you control the changes? There are things like change request, approval processes, Many companies or requirement management tools are out there, like SAP has some tool, Microsoft will have a tool, IBM will have a tool, and some of these tools are sold to other companies as well. So there are many tools and processes to manage requirements. And uh, yeah, so this is what the requirements management is all about. And we might want to version uh, changing requirements, and how you communicate these changing requirements to, to users and uh, developers. Part of the requirements management is also selecting the tools, right? Selecting the right tools for managing these requirements. And one of the challenges, this is kind of uh, 
you can even say this is an unsolved problem. One of the challenges of um, requirements management is how to trace requirements. See, developing requirements is one thing, but finally these requirements have to be translated into implementation. Either th those could be design documents or architecture documents, or there could they, they could be software implementation that is code. So the question is, how do you trace requirements to the code? So you have listed 20 requirements. How do you know that all 20 are implemented in the code? And if requirements change, can we say exactly when this change, when this requirement A changes, these are the bits and these are the software modules which are impacted, which need to be um, uh, updated. So how do you do uh, that kind of traceability? And requirements traceability itself is a big subject because it has impact on effort estimation, managing risk and so forth. So that is another big area under requirements engineering. So this is what uh, you know requirements engineering in a nutshell is all about. Uh, any questions at this point before we go into design thinking? Anyone has particular questions on requirements engineering? You all can unmute and ask questions. Yeah, yeah. OK, maybe still too early. We'll come back to the Q&A later. Now we come into that uh, look at the topic of design thinking. Some of you might have heard this term design thinking. What do you understand by that? Any volunteers? Design thinking is not a new term, actually. Well, the term may be new, but the approach has been around since the 1960s. But only recently, maybe in the last uh, 20 years, you know, it has picked up. Uh, emphasis towards design thinking has picked up. And applying design thinking to requirements engineering is even more recent. Anyone wants to have a go? What is design thinking? OK. No, no uh, volunteers. Yeah, Arvind, uh, I think it's uh, the thought process behind uh, UX uh, designing uh, uh, user interface and UX. Yes, yes, that is correct. Yeah. So okay. that is uh, part of the answer, not entirely correct, but yes, design thinking is related to experience, you can say. Yes. So the keyword here is user because design thinking brings with it the user perspective. Designers try to see the problem from the user's perspective. That is one of the like essentials of design thinking. So your answer is not totally wrong or not. I would say not totally accurate, but it is part of the answer. So let's look at design thinking. Uh, it's like a problem solving method or an approach. And uh, at the heart of design thinking is the user perspective. So the uh, Goal of design thinking is not to give you a solution or give you uh, requirements uh, for the project. The real goal is of design thinking is to enable you to understand the needs of the users. And in the process, enable better collaboration, better ideation, creativity, innovation within the team. And how does uh, so what is the overall process? We will not go into all the details of design thinking. So this Devo Devopedia article gives you the full picture. But briefly, if you ask me, design thinking has this structure or process. It has three parts. One is discover, one is design, one is deliver. But it's easier to understand in these five steps. Empathy, define, ideate, prototype, test. So when you say empathy, we are trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the user. How do users view the problem? And uh, you know what is the expectation from users? And this is not as easy as it sounds, because as I said in the beginning, as developers, it is natural for us 
maybe by habit we take often the developer's view of a problem so that is why sometimes startups like startups who have a resource crunch who can't like uh, hire a designer if they try to do everything on their own and their team is entirely composed of developers they may not do a good job so their product may be functional it has a lot of features it may even be a quality product but in terms of usability it suffers and if usability suffers users may not adopt the product so that is where empathy becomes important then define is trying to define the problem from the user's perspective again then comes the other aspects ideating that means uh, looking at different solutions to the problem prototyping coming up with a quick and dirty or let's say what typically what they call a paper based prototype we are not talking about software implementation right we are only talking about a paper based prototype and even if it is a software implementation i would say it's more of a digital implementation you use any kind of drawing tool to show a kind of a visual prototype to users and with these prototypes you can validate the ideas so you see there are two uh, kind of uh, colored areas here this uh, what we call uh, quadrilaterals let's say the left side quadrilateral is the problem space the right side quadrilateral is the solution space so design thinking involves these two uh, spaces here we are trying to explore the problem space and in the process understand the problem clearly from the user perspective here we are trying to explore the solution place space and in the process we are trying to identify a solution which will uh, kind of fulfill the needs of the user so this is the beauty of design thinking it is integrating both exploration of the problem space as well as the solution space now coming to the point that uh, one gentleman made just now that design thinking is about user experience indeed it is user experience one of the central things in design thinking because when you uh, explore either the problem space or more particularly the solution space we have to consider user experience but if you look at this particular diagram here take a look at this diagram hcd can anybody tell me what is hcd there is a related term ucd just take a guess it's not human that tough human centered design pardon human centered design yes exactly so human centric design or user centric design so in some circles this is how they define it human centric design is the overall framework you can even call it the umbrella term and under this framework there are many methods user experience is one of the methods but there are many others service design experience design uh, interaction design another term which is thrown around systems thinking so so many different approaches are there within this framework and one of them is design thinking right so uh, you see design thinking is very much related to user experience it has elements of user experience but it can also be treated as a separate uh, uh, methodology or problem solving approach on its own so that is uh like one of the explanations which people give so with that uh, we'll of course uh, discuss more on uh, design thinking when we see how it is applied to uh, requirements engineering so at this point before we move on any questions okay okay no questions no problem so now what i'll do is i'll show some examples uh, we'll start with a simple example from the world of uh, it's a historic example can everyone see this figure 
of a key a keypad or two keypads one yep. so what is your understanding what app is this on the left is a calculator no, it's a number pad number pad yeah, yeah. It's, it's your uh, caller app on your phone yeah caller app right and as ramanathan said on the right is the calculator Right. right now the requirement is very simple for any app in these two apps that there should be a numeric keypad so that users can enter numbers into the app but now you see how the design has turned out the layout of the keys is very different in the caller app and it is very different in the calculator app calculator app the numbers are in the reverse whereas in the caller app the numbers in are in a logical order because typically this is how we view any kind of i mean we are talking about the common user left to right is the logical view of reading top to bottom so this is a more user friendly design so to speak rather than this design on the right so now even today if you open your app if you open uh, these two apps on your phone see i got these screenshots from my phone which is a nokia c01 plus and android go uh, version 11 but you can see, uh, try this on uh, ios and uh, other kind of devices including your xbox or you know oculus you will find uh, one of these flavors and we can reason why it is like this so now the question is why is the design so different any guesses why calculator layout is like this why the caller app layout is like this uh, arvind in the calculator app we need uh, we have to perform math operations whereas in the caller app we just uh, uh, put the number to either call or, or either to save it we don't have to perform math operation okay that's true but it doesn't explain the variation in the design even if i reverse the order here i can still do math operations nothing prevents me after all this is software right in fact today we have moved away from physical keys all our keys are virtual on the screen on the touch screen so there is no fundamental reason why it should be like this so the explanation is historically yeah, it's been is like saying this. go ahead historically it has been like this so we continue for the calculator that is correct now uh, we have to uh, answer another question why historically it turned out like this so that is the question to be answered ramanathan's answer is correct historically the calculator app has always been like this and today there is no reason for the calculator app to be like this it can be modified to this but the thing is people like accountants they are used to this layout now and even normal users if they have to enter numbers for calculating purposes they are used to this layout whereas the you know more sensible layout is reserved for the telephone so to understand this we have to go back in time uh, to the mid 18th mid 19th century when the earliest calculator apps were invented i mean we have not apps calculating devices so to speak and those devices used uh, because they are not digital uh, they are not uh, digital devices everything was driven through uh, mechanical uh, levers and uh, rotating drums so behind these keys were these kind of mechanical uh, what do you call levers and rotating drums and for calculation uh, if you are coming from computer science background you know that uh, even in today's uh, computer uh, computer implementations we use something called two's complement i don't know how many of you are aware uh, so a number 2 is represented as 2 like 0 10 but the number minus 2 is actually represented as the two's complement so the way to do it is you take value of 2 invert all the digits and add a 1 so that is the 2's complement which is used to represent minus 2 so that is how you know uh, even uh, today's uh, uh, 
what you call uh, computer systems and calculators. That is how it, they work. But even in the mid 19th century, uh, the same method of complements was used, but they didn't use binary complements. Uh, what I'm saying, two's complement. Instead, they, they used decimal complements. So they used, I think, nines complement or tens complement. So for implementing that method of complements, it was technologically easier to reverse the layout of the keyboard. So you see the reasoning for coming up with this keyboard was not user usability or user experience. It was mainly driven by the needs of technology, the ease of implementation for those mechanical devices. That was the reason it was the layout was done like this. And the same layout was there in cache registers. And from cache registers, we got the first uh, modern uh, calculators which used this layout. But in the 1960s, uh, AT&T started researching into a touch, uh, what do you call, uh, a, a handset which was using a touchpad like this. Because if you recall, the first handsets uh, used in the telephone industry were ro rotary dialing. I remember even in my grandfather's house, even in the up to the mid 80s, that rotary phone was being used. Then somewhere towards the end of the 80s, only uh, BSNL replaced it with a touchpad. So when AT&T was researching into introducing, you know, a touchpad like this, they said that there is no reason to design a keyboard like this, but let us ask the users, they said. So they conducted a exhaustive survey and maybe even built some prototypes and gave it for user, gave it to users to try it out. And in fact, they considered as many as 16 different designs, which I'm showing you here. So all these design, designs were shown to users. This is the reverse layout, which was there from the calculator. So this was the first thing they showed to users, but they showed so many other designs. Look at this. Finally, this is the design that was selected by AT&T. And this is how we ended up with the layout for the caller app. Even today, we use this layout, which is a more natural layout for users. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and a zero. But interestingly, uh, when AT&T did this research, they actually found two, two designs, this design and this design, which were both equally efficient and both were preferred by users. So AT&T selected this design, but in the UK, British Telecom selected this design. So the first phones uh, launched in the UK, they used this design. And pictures of that you can still find in the internet. But the phones, uh, you know, used by AT&T used this design. Finally, this is the layout that uh, kind of uh, survived. So I found this uh, example very interesting where AT&T considered user experiences or usability user experience and showing prototypes to users, gathering feedback, and then deciding exactly what kind of layout to select. So this is like one of the things about design thinking. So this is an example I wanted to share with you. Any thoughts or any other examples that people are aware of, you can share now. The reason for the current design is accessibility because you can reach out to any number. Uh, the other British design was difficult. I think that should be the reason why everyone settled with the existing design. That uh, I don't know. Could be, yeah. That's one. You can can reach out to any number, having your thumb on number five, whereas it's difficult with the other design. Yeah, yeah. User experience wise. Uh, yeah, I would put it another way. Uh, you are right. Uh, I I will look at it slightly differently uh, from a technology perspective as well. The three by three layout is easier to. Uh, 
manif not manufacture it is easier physically because your keys can be bigger whereas if you take a 2 by 5 arrangement keys have to be smaller because in a single row you have to fit three five keys so the uh, so the 3 by 3 layout also contributes to usability because your keys can be bigger or the spacing between two ski keys can be more yeah but that's that's another thing i would say yeah and in mechanical devices uh, this uh, there is a small protrusion in number 5 so that blind can navigate the keys okay that also okay. another thing yeah okay so now let's go to the last part of uh, today's session where we'll see how design thinking can be applied to the domain of requirements engineering. So the first thing to note is that, uh, you know, already we are in the world of Agile. See, this is the question that people may have. So already in the world of Agile, Agile is not like the traditional waterfall uh, fall model where you had uh, a very rigid process. You define the requirements and then you move towards uh, the other parts of the development uh, process. But uh, Agile is not like that. Agile emphasizes uh, short, quick iterations. And Agile practices like uh, extreme programming, Scrum, all these are uh, methods within Agile. So they look at short iterations. They look at uh, user experience. They try to build prototypes, gather feedback from users. So all these are already there in Agile, right? So now the question may be, the question will be, why do we need uh, design thinking when Agile is already doing these things? We have moved away from waterfall. So what is the big thing about Agile? So the thing about Agile is, uh, while Agile has been successful, people have found that in terms of usability and user experience, there are still many aspects that Agile has not addressed. So take, for example, the question of, uh, let's say, prototyping. So in Agile, people build uh, prototypes or let's say in lean, uh, what do you call lean manufacturing or lean programming approach. What people try to do, they try to build a MVP. That is minimum viable product. And this product is put into the hands of users and let users you start using the product and then from their feedback, you try to improve the product for the next iteration. So these are some of the things which Agile does. But the prototype or minimum viable product, how, how is this approach in Agile? So when in Agile people build prototypes, they use the same set of tools or software or materials to build the software. So the idea is the prototype should be a starting point for the next iteration of the product. That is prototype naturally leads to the final product. So whatever work you did towards the prototype, that is not going to go to waste. So prototype leads towards the final product. That is uh, the way Agile has been implemented in practice. But you see design in design thinking, prototype is not a high fidelity prototype. It is not something that you implement or in, in software, you don't even need to use the same tools that you use to build your final product. So let's say you are uh, going to build an app. You may be using uh, Android. You may be using Kotlin as the programming language. You may be using certain frameworks, MySQL database, a certain API gateway. There may be so many things you, you may have decided and your software prototype may use all these things in Agile. But in design thinking, we don't care about that. Your prototype can be as simple as a diagram on pen and paper. Because the idea of uh, design thinking is to explore the problem space, to understand the needs of the user. It is not, and the uh, goal is not to build a working software or a working prototype. That is not the goal. Because in design thinking, it is felt that those things actually will uh, 
divert the focus. The focus should always be towards the user, towards exploring the problem space and the solution space. So that is why, you know, in design thinking, we don't care so much. Of, I mean, we care about prototype, but we don't care about a working prototype or a software implementation of the prototype. So that is one of the differences. The other difference I spoke about exploring the problem space or exploring the solution space. So in Agile, what happens is the focus is towards iterations, quick iterations. So usually uh, when they explore in the, uh, let's say the problem space in the initial stages, the exploration is frozen quickly. They don't spend too much time exploring because why? Because Agile puts emphasis on short iterations, a minimum viable product. So they explore the problem space to some extent, explore the solution space to some extent, but once a path is fixed, then they try to do iterations on that path. And they may do uh, course correction along the way, refine the requirements along the way. Those things are all there in Agile, but you see the exploration is not so open and uh, creative or innovative as it is possible in design thinking. So one of the nice uh, quotes I found when researching on this topic is this. So you see, this is one of the things that has been uh, discussed uh, in literature. Agile is always looking to remove options from the table. Design thinking is always trying to keep options on the table as long as possible. Right, so this is a fundamental difference between uh, design thinking and agile. Design thinking is all about exploring the problem space, exploring the solution space. So it leads to more creative solutions, more innovative solutions, and that is where design thinking shines. And one thing about agile or in any typical software engineering or requirements engineering practice is that they are dominated by engineers. And even when you the focus is on user experience, those user experience uh, or usability concerns are addressed by who? Addressed by designers. Uh, who else? Uh, yeah, usability concerns are addressed by designers. So this has always been the case uh, with Agile. But design thinking is not about just engineers or designers. Design thinking needs a multidisciplinary team. And not only that, it's a change of mindset. So in uh, so one some people recommend that what uh, individuals bring to the table is T-shaped thinking. What is meant by T-shaped thinking? T-shaped thinking means that you have to think horizontally. That is, you have to consider various perspectives of the problem as well as the solution. Those perspectives can be technical, non-technical. It can be different quality attributes. So even if you're an engineer, you have to know a little bit about design. You have to know a little bit about the user, a little bit about the entire ecosystem, about the tools. So that broad-based knowledge is important. Second is you have to also think vertically. So you will bring a certain deep expertise in some area. So not all engineers are same. Some engineers will bring to the table more knowledge about testing. Some will have more knowledge about automation or CI CD. There will be others who are experts in cloud computing or cloud infrastructure. Then there will be engineers who are good at design. Then there are architects, right? Then there are people interacting directly with customers. There could be support teams, sales, marketing. And then the, there are, of course, designers. Now, designers should also know a little bit of engineering. They should also know a little bit about the technical feasibility or the technical considerations that go into implementing a project. So this is what design thinking emphasizes. So it's not like in Agile where 
there are some people who are specialized in engineering, some who are spe specialized in design, and they don't talk to each other or they don't understand each other's differing points of view. That is not how design thinking works. In design thinking, every person is expected to know everything, uh, all aspects of the system, but they may be expert in only one or two aspects. That's fine, but they should also know or be aware of other aspects so that they can have meaningful conversations with other uh, team members. And uh, just to you know, uh, elaborate on this one, see agile or any engineering practice for, for that matter, uh, looks at formal specification, make things as precise as possible, document it precisely. But design thinking doesn't emphasize much on documentation. In fact, if there is ambiguity, it is even better in design thinking because it helps you explore your solution space and the problem space further. So that is why you know ambiguity is encouraged because that is what this is trying to say. So you can always go back to the design thinking approach to find more innovative solutions. So these are the basic differences between agile and design thinking. And this is how design thinking can be applied to uh, gathering requirements. For that matter, not just requirements, design thinking can be used in all phases of the engineering process. So I will show you that process uh, shortly. Let me see. So this is an uh, one uh, recommendation uh, from researchers. So if I try to zoom in a little bit. So this is a purely design thinking mode, right? This uh, loop that you see here, this is nothing but the phases of design thinking, which we saw a little earlier. The names are slight, slightly different, but otherwise it is really exploring the problem space and the solution space. Understand, observe, synthesize, ideate, prototype, test. Right. So this is what. Uh, so the first three are exploring the problem space. The next three are exploring the solution space. So when a new project starts, you are typically in this mode of working where you are applying design thinking to the full. So you have your inputs, which is the problem statement, but you don't exactly know what is the problem. So you apply design thinking to understand it fully. And you will go through maybe multiple iterations of this. And any scrum or sprint that you follow, that is applied to the design thinking. That is, you don't go through this process in one sitting. So you iterate this a few times till you get it right or till you get it to some level of maturity. Then, so what are the artifacts that are produced at the end of this design thinking mode? You have some low fidelity prototypes, you have user stories, you have a vision of your product, you have a, basically a good understanding of your user needs. Then you can begin the next phase of the project, which is starting the development. So here, uh, when you uh, start the development, now you don't put focus on the entire design thinking process. Now the loop is shorter because you have kind of uh, understood the problem space. Now you try to iterate more on the solution space through prototypes. So here you developed a low fidelity pen and paper prototype. But here, here you move from pen and paper prototypes towards a software implementation. So this is where you would get towards, let's say, a MVP, a minimum viable product. So now your Scrum is focused on building a minimum viable product, and you can iterate on that. Your Scrum sprints can be iterated on this. Then you, so what are the artifacts produced at the end of this phase? 
you have a much better understanding of your uh, i mean now all the details are flushed out it is no longer low fidelity prototypes but you will have a working prototype you may even have uh, non functional requirements which typically are not identified here and you will have a software requirements document which design thinking does, does may not produce right design thinking will not give you a proper written specification but that is something you can uh, do it by this phase and once those uh, things are in place then you can move towards your typical scrum that is the project is in full swing now you are ready to deliver your product to the customers with every sprint so now design thinking has a, a lesser role design thinking is invoked only on a needs basis so you are doing your scrum sprints and the things are clear but when there is a change of requirement or when there is a change request a bug comes uh, is discovered then uh, on a needs basis you invoke design thinking the process is again the same but then design thinking is invoked on a needs basis so this is how design thinking can be implemented by organizations so to summarize typically when the project starts you are in full design thinking mode then as the project matures towards implementation and delivery design thinking is applied as and when required so this is how uh, it is and design thinking is not just an approach it has its methods so many methods are there and methods are recommended by people so this is an example what are the kind of methods that you can use uh, to gather requirements using the design thinking approach so you create user personas like uh, you know jim and uh, mary in this case joanna and cindy and you describe you know what are the preferences of these users what are the attributes what are their behaviors and from that you try to identify the needs and you may conduct interviews sit with the with these people try to have discussions and so forth so these are all practices or methods within design thinking then you pr produce prototypes like this right on pen and paper give it to users gather feedback feedback then you go through the user journey so what are the steps the user will take to fulfill those needs which are identified here like user will open the app the user will go to this particular screen etc etc so how those needs are fulfilled then from the perspective of the product what is the blueprint that means exactly what is the user interface interface and what are the interactions that will like realize this user journey that is what blueprint looks like but this is just an example i have shown here but if you look at uh, design thinking uh, itself there are like dozens of methods out there so i can show you what those methods are design thinking has uh, dozens of methods i might have this article has probably listed here so you can see here these are some of the methods used in design thinking interviews shadowing that means you closely follow the users or immerse yourself in the settings of the user and then uh, you know try to see things from their perspective seek to understand non judgmental for defining the problem personas role objectives decisions challenges pain points for ideating on different solutions these are the things prototyping mock ups storyboards which some of us like wireframes also come in this so some of us in the app industry we are already doing these things then finally validating the requirements understanding impediments what works role play iterate quickly so does design thinking has lot of uh, methods and uh, the uh, many of these can be applied to requirements engineering so this is uh, what i had to share any questions
So we can have Q&A if there are any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first of all, great uh, uh, discussion, great presentation. Uh, Thank you. So uh, I wanted to know that uh, if a company acquires another company, like this is the situation uh, which is happening in my company. So what is happening is my company is acquiring another company, a small company, and they have their own uh, database. So now the company, when it gets acquired, we will be integrating their uh, DB platform to our platform. So okay. uh, can we use this uh, design thinking uh, in our uh, uh, environment? Because we will be sitting with those, uh, 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 with the other company, the leadership board, and then we will be understanding what is their architecture and uh, then we are going to implement that architecture in our uh, environment or uh, we are going to integrate it. So is design thinking applicable here? Yes, yes, it's applicable. Um, it's not user base, but uh, it's not because they have their own users, but because we are acquiring the entire company. So we are just going to integrate the uh, database in our environment. Similarly, the developers will have their own discussion with them. SREs will have their own discussion with them. Like all the teams will have their uh, like combined discussion. And then uh, we will integrate their environment with us. So how will design thinking approach be uh, utilized here? Yeah, so first uh, point is that design thinking is applicable, but uh, it may be uh, not immediately obvious because it is uh, different from your problem is different or your situation is different from the typical uh, app development experience. So here, uh, so one thing I will start. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, yeah, it is because wrong the, product, to... the product is already developed here. They have their own product. No, we no, yeah, I'm not talking about the product. Here the thing is integration. Integration is the task that is to be done. Yes. So yes. the whole thing should be seen from that perspective. We are not talking about developing a product here. What is the right. problem? Uh, there are two independent systems, independent databases, maybe independent ways of accessing the databases with the rest of the enterprise. So that is the problem to be solved. It is not app development. So now, how do you approach this problem in the design thinking way? So I would say here we have to look first identify the users. Users are not users of the app. There is no app here. Here users are people who use the data from these databases or what kind of applications are accessing these databases? What are the modes of access? What are the privileges or the security practices which are put in place? So all these things uh, and who are the stakeholders for all these things? So those stakeholders are the people you need to look at. What are their needs and requirements? So this whole design thinking will uh, is about uh, looking at from the perspective of those stakeholders. OK, yeah. Yep. Any other questions? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. So Arvind, I have one question here. Like uh, I, I am from the data engineering background. So can Go this ahead. design thinking be applicable for data engineers rather than uh, for developers also? Is there any thought? Yeah, so I would uh, ask you another question. Uh, give me a typical problem or a task that you do as a data engineer. What 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 your manager comes to you? Uh, what is the task that your manager has assigned to you? Let's say for the coming week or next week. Sure. So we work on the sprint model. If you go back or you can share your screen, um, it's uh, so we have uh, sprints. Basically, we have backlogs, right? So yeah. If you can scroll up a bit, please. The very first slide, you uh, 
Uh, this one, yeah. So if you see here, we do a sprint planning, we create a user stories, and we work on the user stories which are which are ad hoc, which are getting from the business, right? So after that. We deliver that as part of sprint. If it is not being able to deliver that, go as a sprint backlog. Then we pull it into the next sprint. All the stuff it happens here. For me, uh, uh, the good thing which which I can see over here is like a design thinking. All this understand, observe, synthesize, ideate, prototype, test, right? So all this happens way before. Let's say if I'm starting my sprint planning. So I'll be having a set of user stories, what I need to achieve, what I need to develop, right? Who who has given you these user stories? That's the question. A business business users, right? Let's assume that there is a, some new requirement, right? So as yeah, of, but how did it. business arrive at these user stories? Did they have a design thinking approach, or no. is no. it just no. a business? Sure, sure. Business sure. guys yeah. deciding what the user stories are. No, the user stories are, if I'm not wrong, the whole, it is only uh, completely uh, defined by safe, right? As safe as I like, like, for example, it's, I have a scrum team, I have a scrum master, I have a product owner, and I have set up developers here, right? So requirement comes uh, as a single statement from the business stating that, okay, I need, I, I need to see this data in this particular dashboard for which, what are the source systems, how the, how data need to be get into the, uh, different zones of uh, it's either it could be a cloud or data warehouse whatever it may be then it comes to the reporting side all those stuff. this is the life journey basically right yeah, yeah. so the thing is when uh, user stories are already given to you uh, we hope that uh, you know people have identified those through the design thinking approach if they have not done that there is a danger that whatever you are going to implement uh, they may not uh, satisfy the user's uh, actual needs. Okay. So okay. Uh, to me, it looks like this is something not in, in your direct control because you are given the user stories. Huh, correct. But in this diagram, if you see here, yeah. um, somewhere from the sprint backlog, DT, the, the very first diagram at EA, design thinking mode, yeah. you, you see here, it, it, the arrow marks are going from de, uh, design thinking sprint backlog, right? Uh, so when, so when the it, thing is this, uh, yeah, this should have been done by your business people by involving you or as many different stakeholders as possible, so mm -hmm. that they get, they get multiple perspectives to get this cycle right. Okay. Okay. So ideally, since you are one of the data engineers who is going to implement this, you should also be involved in this uh, cycle before the user stories are framed. Because you are the one going to implement, so your perspectives are also important here. Okay, okay. Right? Okay. But let's assume that for some reason your uh, business people did not involve you or did not involve the many other varied people in the organization. So they produced a shoddy user story. All is not mm -hmm. lost. Uh, from your perspective, also, you can do something. So when you mm. do your initial development, you build a quick prototype. You don't mm. do the full implementation. Do a quick prototype and show this. Mm -hmm. Show this to your team. Show this. That is why here there is a smaller circle, if you notice. Because mm -hmm. in Scrum, you have daily stand-up. Okay. Mm. So in this small circle, there is a uh, daily click-through of prototypes. That means daily you are getting user feedback. Are you on the right track? Is there something that you can improve on? Okay. So that is the reason this thing is emphasized, where you can, in, in fact, send this back to your business people or other people who gave you those stories. Okay. Or maybe your product project manager who is there in the daily Scrum meetings. Okay. Show them the prototype. Is this what you want? So okay. this kind of forms the, this loop where you are uh, testing the implement that is gathering feedback and then bringing in more information, synthesizing that and coming up with a better implementation and so forth. Okay. Okay. Right. So this will kind of overcome some of the problems introduced in the user stories in case you know, business people have not followed the design thinking approach. 
okay okay so so if i if i ask uh, ask or keep the question in this way so what is the main scope or objective of this design thinking like uh, let's say it does it comes with any sort of framework where it tells that hey look unity follow this and all sets to satisfy this design thinking mode no no there is no recommended framework prescribed uh, framework or method it okay. has a bunch of methods dozens of methods you can pick and choose whatever you want okay so okay. what are the, what are the essential things of design thinking essential thing is you have to look at every, everything from the perspective of users so that is the first thing second thing is creativity and innovation try to uh, look at it from multiple perspectives and your team itself should be very diverse diversity is again an essential attribute if your team uh, which is looking at the business requirements is composed of only business people and engineers it's not going to work if it's only uh, business engineers and designers it will work slightly better but even that is not enough what should be the case you have to have many people on board sales marketing uh, engineers designers and they should also be aware of what the other guys are doing in the team so it emphasizes higher degree of collaboration higher degree of discussion okay okay makes sense right and uh, see a lot of time will be spent just discussing you may not uh, you may spend 3 hours without coming to a conclusion that is the design thinking approach but in those 3 hours you may have identified so many things so many ways of looking at the problem so many uh, alternative solutions so all this you would have uh, discovered but you may not have selected any one of them so you may do that with in further meetings two three meetings may be required the discussion meetings may be there and through that process you know you will arrive at something Okay, makes sense. Thank you so much. Any further questions? One more thing they recommend when you apply design thinking, the teams should not have uh, a designated leader because typically in agile or when people are doing user experience when a meeting is organized somebody will be leading the team and typically that guy will be a usability engineer or designer so he will be leading the discussion but that has its own set of problem because now all all your perspectives are uh, through the lens of usability at the expense of other attributes so in design thinking uh, you know that is not the case it's uh, ideal if the team which is discussing or trying yeah going through this design thinking process doesn't have a leader so everybody is equal everybody has a equal uh, say during the discussions and in agile you know one of the things about uh, requirements engineering what is the final outcome of requirements requirements are supposed to are the outputs of uh, requirements engineering of course and in agile these or even in waterfall model these requirements become inputs towards modeling because that is how the whole process in software engineering is structured modeling simulation then building the software and so forth but in uh, what do you call in uh, design thinking modeling is not so important because just now somebody asks ask me what are the i don't know tools or something you ask so modeling it's an important aspect in uh, agile but not in design thinking okay i think uh, we are done uh, so thanks for joining this call and uh, a recording of this session will shortly be uploaded on our youtube channel on devopedia's youtube channel which you can find by going to youtube and just searching for devopedia and lastly uh, i showed you some information on uh, design thinking 
all that information will go online on our Devopedia site. I was hoping to publish it before this talk, but I didn't have the time. So I will be publishing shortly, maybe within an hour or so. And then uh, that uh, information will also be accessible on our site. So on a final note, uh, yeah, uh, so we are start uh, starting the year with this talk. Any of you want to give uh, talks on the Devopedia platform, you are welcome. Just uh, get in touch with me or other uh, or Ramanathan, who is on the call, he is also one of the trustees. So just get in touch with me on LinkedIn or Meetup, and then uh, yeah, you can also give a talk on our channel. Somebody raised a hand, Poonam, go ahead if you have a question. Yeah, hi Arvind, uh, thank you for this. I think I joined a bit late. I had to wrap up another office call. Okay. Um, um, I wanted to ask one thing. So I'm a product designer. And okay. uh, the only designer in the in the organization, and uh, I like I am used to follow design thinking, and it's very efficient. We all, I mean, the designers know it already, but I okay. wanted to, I wanted to try uh, I wanted to make it turn into a framework or something that is easy for other product team members to follow, and to improve the collaborations that we do to make it more efficient instead of you know coming back and forth getting getting some more data on it after two, three requirement calls and things like that. Okay. So uh, I wanted to take your input there that um, if you are, if you are, I, I, I'm guessing you would have done it before, or maybe you would, would have done it so many times, but uh, if you are supposed to, uh, you know, introduce design thinking to a larger scale people, for example, leadership of your company, um, the goal I have is I just want to, make the collaborations more efficient. I want to help them um, getting things done without a lot of communication and spending a lot of time on, you know, just gathering what are we making this, who are we making this for? You know, things like that, that we do in empathy and define phase of design thinking. Yeah. How would, you, how would you plan for it? How would you approach that initiative? Yeah, this is tricky to answer because whatever you have said as problems, that is the nature of design thinking because there is a lot of discussion involved yeah and, uh, there is a lot of this uh, going back and forth because in the first sitting or after even after a few sittings you may not arrive at an answer but that's you might the have, thing. Uh, we don't yeah. have a lot of time no not, yeah, not yeah, yeah. We have a lot of time we'll have to limit and make so it so this is a practical challenge in the industry because mm -hmm. uh, organizations are still reluctant to adopt this design thinking because in organizations they are very much used to streamlined processes right yeah, and right. Uh, milestones deadlines these are all uh, milestones deadlines and budgets these are all very much uh, important considerations for organizations right so for them design thinking is very open uh, and uh, they see it sometimes as a risk because it's very difficult to see where is the closure how long do you need to complete the design thinking? So mm -hmm. again, there should be a balance drawn. So Absolutely. Uh, and uh, they, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be too short, but at the same time, it shouldn't be too long. Yeah, I think yeah. it should be somehow the balance of what we want at the, as an output of this. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So what do you think? How would you, I mean, what do you say? How should that be approached? Uh, um, what I have done as a preparation for now is I have tried to um, create few generic questions that would fit into any new feature that we are designing so that they would think about what are we making this for, how this will be used so that I as a designer will get an insight and they as a product board or they will think about it, they will have all the clarity beforehand. So yeah, yeah that is good because yeah, that's how I'm because approaching if you it present them these things uh, during mm -hmm. the meeting they don't have much time to think these through absolutely yeah so it is better see like i said uh, uh, the people involved in the discussion should have a multidisciplinary perspective so it's good that uh, they have these questions beforehand they mm -hmm. have time to think through them and then come prepared yeah. for the discussion yeah yeah so th that's what i'm for the moment, that's what I could thought that at least this I can try to optimize their time and 
I can say I can at least make them think everything before we come on a call and we start discussing it. So what what we discuss on the call would be only the doubts that I have about the document. Yeah, yeah. For I that matter, ask... even in uh, Devopedia, mm. we have this uh, regular uh, meetings. Mm -hmm. Normally, these are meetings among trustees. Mm -hmm. So typically, we share our ideas before the meeting, so that right. people have time to think through these ideas before they come for the meeting. Right, so they are kind of prepared and they have thought about yeah. it thoroughly. Yes, yes, yeah. Right, so yeah, okay. So I think I'm doing doing on the right track at least. Thank you, yes, thank yes. you for sharing.